today uh, to be involved with all of that. And uh, of course, uh, we pray that, that God was glorified through it all. And we're glad to be here today to be able to lift him up and to be able to praise him. Michael's going to be leading us. Uh, let's get ready to do that. So let's be standing as he continues to lead us in praise. <laughs>
Good morning. Let us bow our heads and pray to our God. Our Lord and Savior, we come to you in prayer this morning with hearts filled with worship and with thankfulness. Lord, worshiping your greatness, a greatness that goes beyond our understanding. Lord, knowing that you are the creator of all things, God, that you know every count of every speck of sand on this earth, yet you still see every sparrow when it falls. God, we thank you so much for when you see us fall, that you reach down, Lord, and pick us up, that you give us the comfort and you give us your strength. God, we thank you so much for this loving church. Lord, we, we thank you that we have the ability to be a part of the, the earthly body of Christ. God, that we can be your, your arms, Lord, as we reach out to others with love and with charity just as Jesus did while He was here on His earth. Lord, let us be Your feet. Let us take the Word of Jesus. Lord, let us take salvation to others so that others can enjoy the rewards that we have in You, Lord. Lord, we ask that You bless the elders of this church, God, and give them that spiritual wisdom that they seek so that they can lead this church in a direction that's going to be pleasing to You. Lord, we thank you for every blessing that you give us every day, Lord. And let us acknowledge every day that everything that we have comes from you. Even the breath that's in our lungs, Lord, comes from you. Lord, we're thankful most, Lord, for Jesus, for the perfect sacrifice that came uh, down to this earth. Lord, we know that even before the beginning, he was with you. Lord, he was in glory. And He came to this earth and suffered and died so that we can have remission of our sins, Lord, forgiveness of our sins that I know that I don't deserve in any way. God, we ask that You be with our country. Lord, we ask that You give wisdom to those who are leading us, Lord. Find a way into their hearts so that that we can be brought closer as a country to You, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your spirit that you give us, that you give to us, Lord, as a comforter, and also to give us strength, and that, Lord, that we listen to the words of that spirit every day as we know those are your words. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' mighty name, amen. as a man, 
he humbled himself in obedience to death, even death on a cross. What a great example we have of selflessness and ways of God. A great example of how we can find other ways to be selfless to others, to serve others, to love others. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond
John chapter 15. John chapter 15, and I'm going to begin in verse 9. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. And just as I obey my, my Father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things that you will be filled with joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves, but because this master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. This is my command. Love each other. I hear a lot about love. I hear it said all the time in Bible classes and church services, in the radio, if you listen to the right stations. You hear a lot about love, and, and it's usually kind of like, this is my favorite example, it's kind of like you're going to go to a high school prom and slow dance with Jesus. It makes me queasy. It makes me sick. Because that is not the love that God is showing us. That's not the love that drove a man, an old man probably, when he started a big boat. It's not the love that kept him building that boat for the salvation of his family. In spite of the world telling him that he's a fool. They don't even know what rain looks like. And then to spend a year in a zoo. That's not the love that drives a man to pick up all of his possessions and travel around the desert because God said, go. It's not the love that drives a man to take his son to a mountaintop and sacrifice him. His son that he had waited for, for 90 years. That's not, the, that's, that's not the warm and squishy love that drives somebody to do that. It's not warm, fuzzy feelings that motivates a man to endure being thrown in a pit, sold into slavery, unjustly condemned to be in prison, and then to face his accusers and forgive them and welcome them and call them into the richest blessings of Egypt. It's love that drove the men like Moses and Joshua and David to be incredible warriors, soldiers, who laid down their life on the battlefield because of their love for God. That's not happy little kind hearts and unicorns and rainbows. That's a real love that drives Ben to do that. That's the love that we enjoy. The love that would stir up men and women to leave their homes, to leave the comfort of their lives, and go to places like Burma and India and China to preach the gospel. That's a serious love. To endure hardship after hardship, persecution. It's a crazy love that will strengthen someone to say, you could burn my body. You can tear me apart. You can pierce me with swords. You can cut me in pieces. You can do anything you want. But I will not renounce the name of Jesus. That's a crazy love. 
It's a love that lays down your life for your brother. Right now in our, in our community, it's a little bit easier than normal to show love. It's pretty clear. Somebody doesn't have power. Somebody's hungry. Somebody's from out of town putting electricity back so we can go back to our warm or to our cool and, and comfort, creature comforts that we enjoy. It's the guys out there trying to get our internet fixed so we can watch the ball game. It's easy to spot love right now, right? It's easy to be able to you know, take them a meal, rake a yard, pick up sticks. It's clear, I guess you'd say. But what about when all these people leave and we go back to the new norm and we can get over these face masks and we can live without fear of a virus? What's going to love going to look like for you then? Are you going to be as dedicated then as you are now? Because it's hardships that make for hard men and women. It is hardships that drive us to be more dedicated than ever before. It is hard times that make for good people. We stand out. But what about when times get good again? And they'll come. And it'll be digging deep to show that real love. It'll be digging deep. What drives, what kind of love can drive a man to stay on the cross? Knowing that all he had to do is say no and call legions and legions of, of angels to come and rescue him and crush his accusers. What kind of man, what kind of love strengthens a man to stay in the grave, goes through unknown spiritual warfare during that time? What kind of love can raise a man from the dead so that we can be redeemed, so that we can go to heaven, so that we can have salvation? What an awesome love that is. It's that love that's brought you here today. Like, literally, to this table. It is that incredible love that we celebrate at this table. What an awesome time we have this morning to commune with that kind of love. A love that is so strong, so powerful, so mighty. That's the love we celebrate now as we partake of the body. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the love that you showed us. The love that would that your son would give up his body to create a spiritual body of believers who trust in you. We thank you so much for your grace that brings us to the cross. So much love that you did not let your son see decay, but you rose him from the grave and, and overcame death that we may live. We thank you for this time, for this bread. It reminds us of your son. Christ, let me pray. Amen. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. Jesus healed you. Jesus fed you. Jesus gives you purpose. Jesus gives you encouragement and drive in life. Jesus washes your feet. He serves you, calls you out of darkness, 
brings hope and joy. Allows you to go and walk through any fear because he is with you. The creator of the universe is by your side to carry you through. And he asks us to love him the same, to love each other in the way that he has loved us. Love one another as I have loved you. That's hard. That's when it gets real. That's when you come to the table and recognize that we are called to a big task that will only be accomplished when we partner alongside God. When we recognize that he has the strength and he's called us into that. It only takes place when we recognize that a cup of juice represents salvation. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, this is our salvation. It reminds us of what God has done for us through Jesus' blood to save us. But now it's time for us to die. I know it's a strange cycle and it just, it, it's amazing to think through, but just trust that it's simple to know that the blood cleanses us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this cup of salvation that we can partake together with you as a family, knowing that you call us your sons and daughters, knowing that your, your son who gave his life for us now calls us friend. We are so blessed to be able to come to this table with unity of mind and spirit and drink of your salvation, knowing that we have life eternal because of your love. In Christ's name we pray. We now have an opportunity to recognize that everything that you have on your body, in your closet, in your house, in your garage, in the, par in the parking lot, down in wherever you have stuff, we now have the opportunity to recognize where it came from, who created it, why we have it, and how we can use it for God's glory. Everything, nothing left behind. Naked you came into this world, and naked you're going to go. No U-Haul behind your hearse. This is a great opportunity for us to recognize, more importantly than what we have, where it came from and whose it is. This is an opportunity to remind ourselves financially that we don't own anything. We're just loaned. It's just given to us for a little while, like dust, like a vapor. Just for a moment, you can hang on to it. And God says, use it wisely. God asks you to be his partner again. Remember, we talked about we're partnering with God. This is an opportunity for us to partner with God and spreading the gospel locally, globally. There's an opportunity to share in God's riches as we give back. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless what we have. Not so that we could glory in its multiplication. Not that so we can just have more. But that we can do more for your will. Lord, we just pray that if you give us a talent, that we will use it for you. And that then, if it's multiplied, we will give you glory. Father, we're thankful for this offering that we can lay at your throne this morning. We're thankful that we can participate 
and the, the gospel, the advancement of the gospel and, your, and the spread of the kingdom. Thankful so much for what we do have. We pray that we will always use it to do good for others, to make disciples, and to spread your word of the kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Let's begin today with a random question. How many of you prefer the window seat on a plane? Or what about the aisle seat? Is there anybody possibly in here who would like to sit in the middle seat? Now, for all of you window seat lovers, I've got something for you. There was an article that was written by Dr. Becky Spillman, a psychologist from London, who said, passengers who favor the window seat like to be in control. They tend to take an everyone-for-themselves attitude toward life and are often more easily irritable. They prefer to exist in their own little bubble. And all this time, I thought they just wanted to look at the clouds out the window. Now, I have no idea or not whether this lady is right. But I do know this, that too often times our default attitude is selfishness. We get mad if somehow we are awakened before the alarm goes off. We get upset if our morning routine gets out of whack. We get angry if the drive through line is too long and we can't get our coffee and our breakfast burrito. We naturally think of ourselves, our needs, our wants. And I think it takes effort. And most of all, it takes Christ to overcome our selfishness. And the world we live in does not help us in our pursuit for selflessness. We post selfies. We edit our images. We self-promote the best part of our lives. We post pictures so that we can get likes and we refresh our notifications all the time to see who's looking. The world we live in feeds our innate ability to be selfish. Because we think, you know what, I, I want to be like her. And so selfishly we spend our resources trying to improve ourselves. Or we want to do the things that he does. So we selfishly spend our time in all these activities. Or we want to have what they have, and so we selfishly spend our money in order that we can possess all of these things. And the result is this. The more we think of ourselves, the less we think of others, and the more self-centered we oftentimes become. And Jesus said the second greatest commandment of all is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul kind of expands on that a little bit. When he wrote in Philippians 2 and he said, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. And the question of the morning may be this. How do we get past the self-centered thinking and lifestyle that so often appears on our screens every day? And Paul would go on to tell us, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. To love your neighbor and to value them more than yourself We have to have the mind of Christ, a humble mind. The one who gave us the greatest demonstration of selflessness there was. Because he regarded humanity's greatest need, forgiveness and reconciliation. He regarded the will of the Father greater than than his own glory, 
all to the point that he was willing to go to a cross and to die for each one of us. And so church, somehow we must turn the selfie lens off of ourselves, away from our faces, away from our needs, and away from just our wants, and turn it towards Jesus. Oswald Chambers said, I'm here not to realize myself, but to know Jesus. So the question might be, what does selflessness look like? And by the way, this sermon is not because I think we all need it. I just think sometimes we all need to be reminded, especially me. So what does it look like? It is generous in stewardship. There are three views about generosity that we have. And by the way, I think all three of these are found in the Bible somewhere. Perhaps we have the bag view. And the bag view of generosity is this, there's never enough. This is my bag and there's not enough in it. So I've got to take care of this bag. This is, this is my chocolate. This is my window seat. This is my time. This is my money. This is my bag. And then there's the basket view. The basket view says there is enough. That in God's economy, there is enough. And what Jesus tries to do is to get us to look beyond the world's expectation of generosity. When he said, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use it will be measured back to you. So the idea of a basket view of generosity. But then there's the barn view. And the barn view says this, there's way more than enough. It's an attitude of abundance. It's trusting not in my bag. It's not even trusting in the basket. It's trusting in the abundance of God. That God can do more than I could ever think or more than I could ever ask. And folks, the kind of view that we have towards generosity goes a long way in determining our selflessness. Now, either you have not been a part of the known world or hiding under a rock for the last four years to have not have heard the phrase quid pro quo. It simply means I will do something for you that equals the value of what you will do for me. So think about this. When was the last time that, that you gave and didn't really hold back in your true generosity? The last time you gave and didn't count the cost, The last time you gave and didn't expect something in return. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he's talking to them about those Christians in Macedonia who had given out of their poverty. He is blown away and he is amazed at how these people have been able to give when basically they had nothing to help their brothers and sisters who were hungry and hurting in Jerusalem. Now, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't ever give us an amount. He doesn't give us a percentage. He is just overwhelmed at how it could humanly be possible to give as such an impoverished people. He said, for they gave according to their means as I testify and beyond their means. And of their own accord, begging us eagerly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. They're begging of how we can help in this ministry. That is what generous stewardship looks like. It's irrational. So how is it possible? How is it possible to give more than your means? It means that you give up something. 
so someone else can have something. Selfless. Here's what it looks like, faithful in service. Serving is not just what we do, it's who we are. Think about this. If, if someone was to describe you with the word always, what would they say? He is always doing such and such. She is always doing this. What is it that they would say about you that you are always doing? You see, the word faithful implies that there is something that you are doing. Dorcas sewed clothes for the poor and the widows. And the Bible says that she was always doing good. We have to be willing to do whatever it is, even if it's insignificant in my mind. Even if no one else sees it. What you do may be behind the scenes. But getting promoted in the kingdom of God is never about self-proclamation. It's about serving. The image of Christ washing feet is perhaps one of the most powerful images that we find in the New Testament. They are in the upper room. It's the Passover meal. They're all set in a room on the table and Jesus is there with them. His entire life purpose is about to unfold. And do you remember what happened? An argument breaks out. They begin to argue over goats. Greatest of all time. Who's going to be the greatest of all time? Who's going to get set next to Jesus in the kingdom? Who's going to get to be the most important? Who's going to get the most recognition? And Jesus is sitting there and he's looking at a bunch of proud hearts and a bunch of dirty feet. And so he gets up and he goes over and he gets a bowl of water and he gets a towel and he kneels down on his knees and he starts washing feet because Jesus knows that the greatest is those who are willing to serve. And so remember over in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus says, you know, one day I'm coming back and when I get back, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate all you folks and over here I'm going to stick the sheep and over here I'm going to put the goats. Those people who said, Who's the greatest of all time? And Jesus is going to say, I don't know who y'all are. But to those sheep, come you blessed, who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. And I was in prison, and you came to me. How do we become great? It's less about me and more about Christ. It's more about others and less about me. Selfless. And it also looks like this, bold and sharing. In Matthew 16, Jesus said, to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. When I begin to deny myself, I become selfless. And instead of asking God to bless me and help me, I begin to ask God to use me. Use me to bless others. Use me to share. Use me to, to reach more. We speak boldly about that which we believe deeply. In, Peter, in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John are told by the Jewish rulers not to speak anymore about Jesus. And so Peter and John answered them and said, whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than God, you be the judge, for we can't speak of what we have, cannot speak, but of what we have seen and heard. What is it that you can't stop talking about? 
ball games yesterday, the election in November, the virus. What about Jesus? Back in verse 13, it says this, And now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. They were amazed. They were amazed at their boldness for Christ. How amazed are people at your boldness for Christ? And notice the two things that, that, that amazed them. They were ordinary people, just like you and me. And that it was clear that they had been with Jesus. So what does that say to us? We're ordinary people. We just have to go out there and live lives that it's clear to people that we've been with Jesus. And they'll be amazed. They'll be taken back. But here's the really cool thing about that story. After the Jewish rulers let them go, what happened? They had a prayer meeting. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. They didn't ask God to protect them. They didn't ask God to stop them from picking on them. They didn't ask God to defeat their enemies. They asked God to make them more bold. Why? Because it was never about them. It was always about others and sharing Jesus with them. Selfless. We close this morning. Well, the last couple of weeks, I have witnessed some incredible kindness, compassion, generosity, love. People who live close by, we have helped them clean their yards. People who we've never met, we've helped to feed them. People we've never spoken to, we've asked them how they're doing. And our Facebook pages have been littered with, with pictures and posts of doing good and helping people who are in need and, and looking out for our neighbor. And I guess what I'm trying to say this morning is this. What if we loved our neighbors as ourselves all the time? Not just when there's a disaster or pandemic or when it's the right thing to do or when everybody else is doing it. What would it really look like if we loved and valued our neighbor? more than ourselves all the time. I love this church. You have shed light into other people's darkness. You have stepped up every time. You have shown Jesus to those that needed to see him. But what about when all the trees are cut and all the trash has been picked up and all the roofs have been replaced? Will we look at our neighbor and ask ourselves the question, how can I love them more? That's what Jesus calls us to do. If today you need Christ in your life, 
the one who loved you more than himself to the point that he was willing to go to a cross and die for you. Then why not respond to him? And while you decide, let's stand and sing. Sun is set, sun is set.